Awesome. Okay, so, so, so far we've sort of seen like the power of deep learning and sort of neural networks all along. So, so I'm gonna jump off that bandwagon for a little bit because uh, some of the work that I've been doing with Pascal it mainly revolves around how we can model tractable dens how we can model densities in sort of a tractable way. Uh, it, it sounds it's a really really fancy way of saying, given a sort of probability function like p of x comma y, can we find it quickly enough so that uh, our our, uh, our sort of runtime is non exponential? And, and this seems like a pretty hard problem because computation of if if any of you have taken physics courses before, uh, there's something in uh, sort of uh, uh, thermodynamics that's called the partition function, which is NP-hard to compute. I'm sure most of us know what NP-hard is. And, and uh, in certain classes of probability models, which is just directed acyclic graphs, you can actually compute this in O of n time. The trade-off, though, is that these graphs grow super big, super fast. Um, and the question is, uh, given that they grow really big really quickly, what can we do uh, with, with the sort of large graph that allows us to sort of compete with neural networks in a much more interpretable way? Uh, and, and one particular class of models that, that I've spent a, a reasonable amount of time on is called sum product networks. And they really are just what they say. They're, they're networks that's composed of sums and products. So, so re really, really simple models, uh, and they have distributions for the leaves. Um, so a sum product network is just a tractable probabilistic model represented by a directed acyclic graph. We all know what that is. Uh, it's just a graph over a set of random variables, uh, and it allows us to model uh, densities really well. Uh, if any of you are not familiar with these terms, feel free to reach out to me after the talk. Um, th th these terms can go into a little bit of detail, arguing exactly what they mean in this case. But essentially, uh, it, it, this, this model allows us to compute marginal densities in O of n time, which is uh, something that is NP-hard in most probabilistic models. It allows us to compute uh, uh, map queries, which is the maximum a posteriori query, it, it also in O of n time, and likelihood in, in O of n time. Now, now before we, we get all excited and say p is equal to NP, it, it's not true that P is equal, well, it's open that P is equal to NP. Um, but essentially what it means is that uh, this model is super big, but it allows us to capture a lot of expressivity w while being this big. Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the original paper was presented by Poon and Domingos in 2011. So again, we're, we're sort of encroaching on very recent territory here, where it's like in mathematics or something else, you'd probably have to look back 40 to 50 years to find out an origin paper. Uh, and this is sort of how simple the diagram can be for, for one of these models, where you have random variables at the leaves, and you have combinations of them using sums and products. And you can believe me uh, that, that at the top you compute the likelihood or, or the joint distribution across all of these random variables. There is a theoretical proof for this, but, but I'll appeal to like proof by authority, and you can just take my word that it does actually compute the likelihood function. Um, also, you, you would notice that there's weights on the edges, and this is just a way to model uh, a, a sort of weighted mixture of random variables. So everyone knows that random variables depend on distributions, so realistically, this is just a mixture of distributions that Priyank had spoken about previously, where you, you sort of combine Gaussians to create a more complicated Gaussian. This is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, Furthermore, to compute the marginals in these sort of models is also super easy. We, we just need to set certain variables to zero. There's a fairly simple proof of why that actually works in this case, and, and I can go over it in some more detail. Okay, so now the question is, why are they actually useful? Because it, it's, it's all well and good if we have a model that uh, is theoretically nice and, and expressive and, and interpretable, but the question is, are, are there like severe f failings of these models? And the answer to that is actually no. In, in 2012, uh, at a very famous conference for machine learning, uh, the, the best paper award was won by a student of, of Domingos who had essentially shown that you can combine uh, some product networks and convolutional neural networks to create the sort of mixture of convolutional neural nets that outperformed the state of the art by about 10% at the time which is a massive jump in performance. 
Uh, in addition, there's also papers that have been coming out more recently showing that you can model more complicated uh, sort of generative models that Priyank had uh, alluded to before, like variational autoencoders or GANs, and you can mix all of these up into SPNs. So it gives you a very nice structure to work with these very, very, very uninterpretable models. Uh, finally, there's also theoretical properties that justify certain methodology. So some of the experiments that I've done in the past have shown that you, if you cluster simple data sets, like uh, how many of us have heard of the MNIST data set? So the handwritten, okay, it's about half of you. So essentially it's about, uh, it's curated images of, of handwritten digits. And, and essentially uh, some of the experiments that I performed showed that uh, you can actually notice very distinct clusters between uh, the, the, the different digits that looked similar. And this is sort of a, a theoretical guarantee that you get where you can say, I can actually interpret to some extent what my model is doing, where we're in neural networks, we just completely lose that 100%. Uh, with the, the ability to interpret is gone. Yeah, so, so now the actual interesting stuff, right? What, what, what kind of research can we do uh, on this in the future? And, and this is nice because it's a very, very niche sort of area. So you're not competing against the Googles and the Facebooks. You're more competing against like uh, academics or, or, or in fact, in most cases, you would be working with some of the people who, who are pioneering this field. So the first one is, um, so, so the, the major library for some product networks is co-authored by me, and it's called some SP Flow or some product flow. And the idea is that you can actually uh, you can build features on top of this library. Uh, now this seems like a kind of boring project. I, I totally understand if it is. You know, maintaining libraries are are not not that fun. But essentially, th this gives you the sort of ability to really get down and dirty with uh, some product networks and how they're actually implemented in GPUs. A second problem, which is a little bit more difficult, is adversarial robustness in SPNs. So in late 2018, there was a theoretical paper by Jordan et al. that, that stated that there's a theoretically principled trade-off between robustness and accuracy. Um, now ever since then, I've been sort of infatuated with this idea that uh, some product networks are, are adversarially robust models because uh, it's very difficult to get some product networks to classify better than like a convolutional neural net unless you use a lot of tricks and a lot of heavy computation. So the question is, uh, at the price of that, do you get something very, very nice? Uh, and the answer to that is, well, well we don't know. It's, it's a completely open problem. Uh, there's a lot of interesting ways of attacking it. And, and one of the nicest ways is to sort of think about MNIST and try to figure out what the decision boundary of MNIST would look like in two space. Uh, again, I realize that that is a very, very uh, wishy-washy sort of methodology of going about a fairly rigorous experiment, but feel free to reach out to me after to actually talk about the experiment in detail. The final one, as Vic had spoken about previously, is about using some product networks in games or, or in reinforcement learning scenarios. So there are extensions to some product networks called some product max networks. And this is essentially adding a max operation to our some product network. And the, the sort of advantage you get with this is now you can actually model expected utility, which is a rigorous quantity, which we won't get into. But, but essentially, now, now that we can model expected utility, it turns out that that's a very good way to model games and sort of rewards. Uh, so the question is, can we now use a form of recurrent some product max networks to model reinforcement learning problems? And it's, again, a very open area. I can assure you with 100% guarantee no one has published uh, on, on any of these areas so far. So if you are interested in sort of moving away from the, 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 the sort of deep learning-esque world and trying to get into maybe a more theoretically justified and principled approach at machine learning, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my, my email address is, is given over here.